All right, well, thank you. That was, uh, that was uh, fascinating. Uh, so next we have a new use case that was approved by the Coordinating Committee in 2019 called Electronic Case Reporting. And uh, John Lunsk has been uh, driving that uh, almost single-handedly. So uh, I'd love to have him explain to you what electronic case reporting is and how you may benefit from it. And uh, I'd love to see if we could get some, um, some of our participants to, uh, to volunteer to begin uh, utilizing that use case. So with that, we have John Lutsk. Hello. As Monty Python would say, and now for something completely different. <laughs> but not. And there is, I think there's supposed to be a clicker up here which will help me do my, there we go, thank you. <laughs> um, so I have been involved in public health and electronic case reporting for some time, but I also was involved in ONC and the National Health IT Agenda before that. And before that, I was working at the CDC proper, doing public health. And when I went to ONC, um, it was abundantly clear to me that we couldn't do a lot of what we needed to do in public health. I was a health IT physician. I was interested in how to use information technology to adv advance population health outcomes, and the infrastructure was not there. And so then we started something that was called the NHIN, or Nationwide Health Information Network. And although we've been through fits and starts for years and years now, the progress we've made is amazing. And what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about the population health activities, the public health activities that I've been working in, and bring it back around to how important the eHealth exchange is and health information exchange is in accomplishing those. And then, hopefully, bring it back to you from the standpoint of why it's relevant. So to start with, though, we need to say why. And in, um, I'm going to go way back, even farther back than I am old, to John Snow, who was a physician in London. And in 1854, he proved that 500 deaths were associated with the Broad Street water pump. This is a famous example in public health because it really represents so much of what the public health model is. First, data were critical in accomplishing this. He needed to understand what was actually a case of, of cholera, what patients fit that criteria, where they were, how they were linked potentially to a common source. And then, in the end, he, he le it led to him taking public health action, which was um, perhaps one of the more tangible public health activities of all time, which was to take the pump handle off the pump so that no one could use that water pump and no one else would get the cholera. To be tr truthful, we've only advanced incrementally since then in public health. And the activities are still those that were outlined by that first case. Surveillance, getting data, getting good data, getting quality data to use it to a population health outcome is still central to that activity. Somehow, I managed to advance the slide. The data was critical. This is a map of the London area around that Broad Street pump. Each of the bars, those pancake-like bars associated with um, that are off of the streets represent cases of the condition of cholera that were documented. And you can see how they physically array around that pump. Ever since then, public health has sought to get as good quality data to maintain cases. A case is a clinical representation of a patient or an individual that may be associated with a disease or may have an environmental uh, circumstance or in the context of chronic conditions um, sometimes uh, as well. Um, but our efforts to get surveillance data have always been approximations because we're clinical care's poor brother or poor sister. And 
you may have had exposure to some of these surveillance efforts in the past. So what is one of them? One of them is electronic laboratory reporting. The idea was that labs were electronic way before there were electronic health records, and public health could take advantage of that and get lab results and use those for surveillance. Now, was the lab result the definitive definition of a case or the definitive definition of critical clinical data that you wanted to, to carry out the public health function? No. But the data were there. They were electronic. They could be accessed directly. The physician didn't have to do anything to do that reporting. The clinical care environment was really barely involved, and lab results were achieved. And it was helpful to public health. Not all diseases are, have a pathognomonic lab result. In other words, the lab result is not all that you need. The breadth of data for a, a case is not there in a lab result. You know, we, we know how little data there actually is in a lab result, but at least you had the lab result. Another approximation at surveillance was syndromic surveillance. And this was really based on the fact that admission, discharge, and transfer systems were electronic well before electronic health records existed. So public health was opportunistic here. Public health said, well, we'll get chief complaints from admission, discharge, and transfer systems because they're in electronic form. It's not the data we really want, but we can use that to benefit public health activities, and we will take it. All of that progress was incremental but positive, but now the world is different. We now have electronic health records. We have electronic clinical data in a form that it can be utilized for fuller reporting, for accomplishing broader public health outcomes. We just have to be able to exchange it. What I'm going to talk about is electronic case reporting, which is taking data from clinical care, electronic health records, and using those data to public health purpose. This is the world that's opened up by health information networks and by electronic health records and can accomplish much more from a public health standpoint. I will say that I, uh, I indicated my history a little bit that um, I was at the CDC. Um, I was at a very interesting time there when the first, there was a West Nile outbreak in New York City, and you may remember that. It was a huge deal in public health. The next year, there was a, uh, the West Nile was found in the blood supply. That was a huge deal. And all of that paled in comparison to what happened the next year when the uh, anthrax attacks occurred in association with 9-11. That turned public health on its ear. It represented the information exchange needs of emergencies as well as of the, the sort of quiescent state of public health activities um, during routine times. And since then, I've been involved in a mission to try to advance the infrastructure in the country to handle both emergencies and routine surveillance because of its importance. Sometimes we don't always pay attention, believe it or not, the, the public only really pays attention when there is an emergency. You have a brief window after that, and Congress maybe thinks they should throw some money that way. And the opportunity to change things gradually deteriorates for, uh, in, a, in a tale that comes from that event. With that in hand, though, and with the uh, growing infrastructure that for health IT, we have some real opportunities. It's not easy, and this is a, a little bit of an eye chart, um, and it's as much to tell you that this is really hard. Public health surveillance is very difficult, and these are the reasons that it is, um, and I will touch on them. First of all, what many people don't know is that public health is actually responsibility of state and local health departments, first and foremost, not the CDC. The, the surveillance laws 
are state laws that build on top of HIPAA. And the states, I, I actually had someone show me a constitution when I first got to the CDC and said, see, right here, this is where we, it says the states are responsible for public health. That's complicating. We have many jurisdictions. There are many conditions. There are uh, roughly 140 conditions that are reported in a voluntary system at a national level. And each of those conditions is funded from top-down funds and thinks that their objectives for their particular condition supersede everything else. In fact, in many circumstances, federal monies could not be used for a different condition than the one that they were uh, originally intended for by a congressional budget line. That situation has improved, but the situation of having individual silos of data reporting has not completely been eliminated. When I first got to the CDC, each condition had its own surveillance system that sat on a desktop in a public health agency. So it wasn't connected to clinical care, but each one was separate, each one was different, each one worked differently, and this complexity of many conditions magnified by many jurisdictions and then by many clinical care sites is a huge interoperability problem, a huge uh, a, a problem in get, getting things done. I mentioned that state laws define reporting, and that's true, and the state laws are all different. So what's reportable in one state may not be reportable in another state. There's some commonality, but it's complicated, and what the data are that are associated with that report, that condition, can differ as well. Complicated. The specific data authorities I just mentioned are, are strictly enforced. So state governments and the public health agencies will only take the data they are authorized to take in association with that report. It needs to be reportable, and it needs to be the specific data that they want and need, or they feel like they cannot accept those data. So HIPAA doesn't actually, uh, the previous speakers mentioned that the individual, the patient, is outside of HIPAA. In fact, government is largely outside of HIPAA too. Government agencies are not under the auspices of HIPAA, but in HIPAA it does point to the fact that state um, public health agencies uh, can have an, a law that authorizes reporting, and every state has those laws, and those are the things that partly make this as complicated. There's a, the, the whole activity of getting data is based on the clinical data that have, as we all know, been relatively poorly structured. They've been, until recently, not very electronic, and this has contributed as well. The, in an emergency, what is the emergency can differ and can be spontaneous. And that is a huge IT and, in, in, and interoperability challenge. So you may remember SARS, the uh, sudden, ad, I don't even remember the name of it, adverse respiratory syndrome that was, it was not even a defined disease when it became problematic and was uh, of great concern. Um, so th the definition for what is, is the problem, the triggering of what needs to be surveilled, um, also can be very dynamic. And then finally, the, the role of the clinician in this has been challenging as well. Most clinicians think of public health as a black box where they report data and see very little outputs. And um, while that's not completely true, one can see where that comes from. And so without that feedback, without understanding the benefit of what the reporting that they need to do, that reporting has not always occurred. And the evidence on reporting, which is the law in every state and territory for public health case reporting, is that it's only done between eight and 80% of the time, depending on the condition. Eight to 80%. So this is the challenge, and this is what we've been working on in electronic case reporting. 
Electronic case reporting is the automated identification of reportable health conditions and their transmission to state and local public health authorities for review and action. And the part that I would add to that definition is it also involves providing feedback to those providers about the status of that condition for that patient in their jurisdiction. So how did we do that? How are we doing that to get around the boundaries and the challenges that I identified? Well, to begin with, we've had to deal with policy scalability. So I'll talk about technical scalability as well, but policy scalability is the ability to get the data where they're needed, when they're needed to, to accomplish it without point-to-point -point data use agreements. Does this sound familiar? Because that is why this, this slide, by the way, is an oldie um, but a goodie. This one was one of the original NHIN slides that we created when we were trying to promote the idea of a network of networks nationally and th of that connectedness and of the value of the DURSA as well as the value of the technical connectivity and exchange that had to occur. Those two things in combination. And this is, to some extent, the derivation of the public health permitted purpose in the DURSA was to address the needed aspects of public health information exchange for these purposes. This is complicated by the fact that currently clinical care cannot implement complex logic. We cannot distribute a bunch of rules to every clinical care environment and say, okay, these data go to this state, these data go to a different state, the, this needs to be reported to the home state of the patient as well as to the place where care was provided. Those kinds of rules are much too complicated to implement in a distributed fashion with every electronic health record with current technology. So we have developed a platform, a public health services platform, that supports that complex logic. And we've only asked that the electronic health records trigger the probable cases with simple logic to initiate that reporting. To do that, the platform needs to be a business associate of the clinical care organization that is helping to report. And that's where the eHealth Exchange has stepped in and is a, now a partner of this public health activity that is being carried out by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists, and the Association of Public Health Labs to indeed um, progress this full electronic case reporting to meet these public health needs. So how does it work? Well, the inside of clinical care, a set of trigger codes are provided to the electronic health record. And when something is matched in that electronic health record, like a diagnosis of cholera, for example, that is then sent off to this public health platform. The public health platform runs the complex logic that determines that that indeed does have to be reported and to whom it needs to be reported, um, which public health agencies need to receive it, and then it channels those electronic case reports onto them. To do that, we've developed standards in HL7 for the electronic initial case report and that includes much clinical data that might be found in a CCDA or a, a, a CCD, uh, CCD, but also some critical public health information that's not there. Think about travel history. Think about uh, other aspects of the clinical case that may be in the electronic health record but need to be associated with a public health case report but not necessarily are part of a clinical document. We also have developed what we call the reportability response, which is feedback that goes back to clinical care for every electronic initial case report that's received. And I will talk about the context for that um, as well. This public health platform is supported in the way that most of public health is through federal and uh, 
funds that come through the CDC, and there is no cost to its use. This is a capability for supporting electronic case reporting that you all can use in association with an HIE or a health system and automate the process of carrying out this legally required public health function. These are the data that are in the electronic initial case report. We have focused on data that were available in the electronic health record or should be there because they were certified to be there for some other clinical care purpose, wherever possible. We don't want manual entry. We're trying to avoid burdening providers. We're automating the process of the reporting to public health. This is a hu huge step forward from a clinician standpoint in terms of the fact that they don't need to fax information, they don't need to manually enter it in a website, they don't need to do anything except provide care. The reportability response serves several different functions, some of which are technical. It identifies the fact that a report has been received and whether that condition that was identified for reporting was actually reportable, the confirmation of it. But as you can, if you could see in, this, in the example here, it also provides information from the public health agency about the status of that condition in that jurisdiction. That's the kind of information that clinicians have been asking for public health to provide to them so that they have value from the reporting process as well. That, it's not a, that public health is not a black box, that it's not a black hole, that it actually is providing information back in a way that the provider can use it just a couple of clicks away at the most and in the context of their patient and in the context of the condition that they have for, um, that, that is in front of them. This is a positive electronic health record outcome. This is not an additional burden to clinicians. In fact, this helps bring them into compliance with something they are legally required to do, does it for them in an automated fashion so that they don't have to do a thing except have their electronic health record implemented. That's the obligation, that's the requirement, that's what we're working on as well. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that and then I'm going to um, stop and, and, and answer questions. So there has been a, a, a national initiative called the Digital Bridge. Um, I see Walter Suarez out in the, in the audience was participant in that process. It brought together health IT vendors, health systems, um, public health agencies in trying to bridge some of the needs uh, for public health clinical care connection. The first activity in the Digital Bridge, and the Digital Bridge was funded by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, the first activity in that process was to look at electronic case reporting. And it incubated in the Digital Bridge. It has now been moved out of the Digital Bridge and is being advanced and operationalized um, by the acronym SOUP of CDC, CSDE, and APHL. It is an operational service that you can take advantage of now. We are just in the process of opening up the public website for onboarding. We can share that information with you. You can take this capability, this digital network capability, think about that. We're talking about something that represents so, so, something that represents many, what many of us have been working on for, for decades, which is to have capabilities on networks that can support better activities in, in association with clinical care and, and make those happen regardless of where they're physically located and regardless of the or, uh, organization under which they're, they're, the clinical care is being provided and regardless of the hardware platform that is being worked. Currently, we are doing all this in what would be known as the CDA world or the CCD world, if you may want to think of it that way, using today's technologies. 
And we are also working on implementing in HL7 Fire. Now, I, I've been around long enough that I know that perhaps the most disruptive thing one can do to health IT is change what standard you're using. I've been around long enough to know that almost every technical advance, and I, I could go into the, 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 the attributes of hype around new technologies, and I, I could talk about the excitement, the building momentum, and then I could tell you, oh, that was about the CDA. That was what happened with CDA. People thought CDA was the solution to every problem. And now it's about fire. If you're as old as I am, you see the pluses and the minuses of all of these issues. All that being said, all the challenges with changing standards and all the challenges with the changes that that requires, we think that FIRE offers a tremendous opportunity for us to move forward in this domain beyond that which we can do in the CDA world. Right now we have the ma major EHR vendors implementing electronic case reporting, but the majority of EHR vendors have still not done so. In the CDA world, in the t existing technology world to this point, they would have to do proprietary development. They need to implement how to trigger, to initiate when a report needs to be sent. They need to program in how to create the electronic initial case report so that they can send that parcel of data to public health for that reporting purpose. And they would have to implement the orchestration of that activity inside their EHR. And there are EHRs that are doing it. The major ones are doing it now, but not all of them. In FIRE, we can do it for them. Between the combination of the, the more robust nature of the FIRE ecosystem, including, for example, things like FIRE subscription, we can have automated triggering in the EHR. With the specification of uh, an app associated with that EHR, we can provide them the ability to create the electronic initial case report without ha them having to program it. And with the ability of FIRE to work with parameters around the interactions inside of the electronic health record, we can also guide them on how the, the when, where's, and how's of how that reporting needs to occur we can give them an implementation guide and it will imp be implemented for that reporting without proprietary software development. And that is a, a great opportunity to advance these kind of capabilities as well as other network capabilities moving forward. So we are now in the process of uh, publishing a, stand a FIRE standard for electronic case reporting. We have the standards I mentioned earlier of the electronic initial case report and the reportability response in CDA, we will be supporting both. We will support both on this common platform. All that clinical care providers need to do is see that their EHR is enabled to do this reporting and it is from there taking care of them, for them um, in this regard. The final comment here that I would point to is, you know, to do this, I personally, as well as others in public health, have had to become very involved in the HL7 community and very inv involved in FIRE. Um, and I, as I told you, I see the benefits of that approach um, as well as the challenges of, of moving to something new. But one of the things I haven't seen there is a real attention to health information exchanges and health information networks in consideration of how FIRE will be implemented. And I've been talking this up in a big way because it is, you know, for me with my network paths, um, I am 
concerned. I w wanted to see that path forward with fire, but in some ways, just the way the health information technology agenda takes two steps forward and one step back, takes two steps forward and one steps back, so do the technical standards. And the, what we're doing in this regard in public health, because we have tremendous need for push transactions. So um, when, whether you noticed it or not, the first version of TEFCA was all query. Well, it's hard to query for something you didn't know existed. It's hard to query an EHR and said, did anything happen? <laughs> Was there a cholera outbreak? I don't know. So w w public health is, is 95 to 98% push, unsolicited push transactions, because that's what reporting is about. And that's the infrastructure we're built on, getting data out of a clinical care organization, getting it to a public health agency, for action, just as I said in the definition of ECR. So we have been working on fire messaging as well. And I think that everyone should be attentive to this issue because the considerations for intermediaries in data information exchange have not been attended to with enough seriousness in the fire community to this point. But we want to be able to push data as well as pull data and pull is great, apps are great, but push is important too. And so we've been working on fire messaging. All the standards I just talked about use fire messaging as, uh, as one of their implementation alternatives. It's, it's not as complicated as it even sounds by just my saying that. All, basically it's just about making data into a parcel so that they can be moved through an intermediary. That's it. It's really simple, but it's still not what people are focused on because in FHIR there's this conflation of RESTful query and the payload standards as well. So I've, I've been on that soapbox for a little while now. I have expressed it to you. I hope that it's something you pay attention to moving forward. I think we've made progress in that regard. What we're trying to do here, too, is have a common reporting framework for the multitude of different things that EHRs need to report on. Public health achieved a certain degree of notoriety in being named prominently in ONC's provider burden report and provider burden strategy because public health reporting is perceived to be a burden, as I've said. We're automating it. That should help tremendously with the burden issues, but the multitude of different reporting needs is also a burden, whether it be quality measures, clinical registries, public health activities, all of these things share many common elements of reporting, but there is very little in the infrastructure to support them. So we've been working on what we call a common reporting framework for FHIR. The concept of it is that we can you know, enable many of these different reporting functions to use common technology, to report automatically and more easily, to reduce the burden on providers in terms of that implementation, and on EHR vendors in terms of the technical aspects of that implementation, and to, to push that all forward uh, in, a, in a way that um, the, the outcomes for these population health activities can be greater, uh, e more easily achieved. So, to wrap up, electronic case reporting. It is truly revolutionary from a public health standpoint. Getting clinical data from EHRs will make the world of difference from a public health outcomes perspective. We're finally at that point. We're finally at a point where we don't have to say, oh, we'll take lab results. Oh, we'll take chief complaints. We can get a, an electronic case reported electronically. We're automating provider bird, uh, reporting. This does not add to provider burden. It reduces provider burden, and it brings providers into legal compliance. Case reporting is the law in every state and territory. It's not 
done with consistency, but it is the law. The approach that I've articulated to you hides the jurisdictional variability. Yes, there are still different laws in every state. Clinical care doesn't have to see that. The EHR vendor has a single interface regardless of what state they're in to accomplish this. And that's a tremendous step forward. By the way, many people don't know that, uh, and, uh, that case reporting needs to be done not only to the place where the jurisdiction where care was provided, but also to the place of residence of the patient. And this is written into state laws as well. It doesn't happen, it happens less even than does it happen, the case reporting happen inside the jurisdiction, but this is also advanced by this platform and by this capability so that the appropriate reporting is done to all the related public health agencies and that is hidden from the provider as well. A single interface accomplishes it all. It provides information back to clinical care around the condition. No more black hole, no more black box. This is a, a, a true bi-directional communication with uh, great opportunities to build on that going forward to better connect public health and clinical care. And finally, if you're on the eHealth Exchange, this is something that you can sell. You can take this to your providers, you can show them the benefits of doing this reporting in an automated way of being in legal compliance versus not being in legal compliance, and it's all provided as a benefit of your work and your participation in eHealth Exchange with them not needing to sign any other, other additional agreements or to implement any exotic technologies um, beyond which that which their EHRs can support. So this, for me, is from a public health standpoint, is tremendously exciting. It's also one of the harbingers of a networked service that is enabled by the kind of connectivity that the eHealth Exchange and other health data networks are now making available. We are going to be connected to the eHealth Exchange hub, and all participants can leverage this and make it their own. You don't even have to give us credit. Just sell it. Thank you. So I think we have time for one or two questions, if uh, anyone. We actually have time for about 10 more minutes. If you have questions and more interactions you'd like, we started a little late, we apologize for that. Thank you. Hi, Paul Matthews from Ocean again. Um, quick question, how many public health departments are ready to start receiving ECR? So the, the answer to that is not simple either, but we, we are, in the process of operationalizing the platform, I mentioned that, we are connecting, we've connected 60% of the public health agencies in the country for initial connectivity. And that, that doesn't necessarily include high bandwidth reporting from inside their jurisdiction. The numbers that can do that are lower. Um, the, there are at least three of the major surveillance system providers who are now enabled for electronic case reporting. So that would cover roughly um, 30, 30 states. And then do you have a resource guide that we can uh, look to to actually say these are the organizations yeah. able to accept? We're, we're opening up the, the, the um, website for that purpose and others, and it will be online. topic and maybe you're not uh, ready to speak to this, but I'm curious your thoughts if you have any on the, let me make sure I get the name right, Saving Lives Through Better Data Act. Do you have any thoughts on it? I'm sorry, say it again, I didn't quite the make it out. Saving Lives Through Better uh, Data Act, Kim Kane and the $100 million, the idea is to send it to the CDC. Also known as Data is Elemental Campaign, yeah, right, <laughs> that's the name I know it as. So 
Um, what is being referred to is a, a, a budget initiative that um, the CST, Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists, uh, the Association of Public Health Labs, uh, NAFSIS, um, and uh, HIMSS have been um, very responsible for to help try to drive funding to modernize the public health IT infrastructure. And we are very supportive of that initiative. Um, the CDC has also recently received an anonymous donation that is being used to support electronic case reporting as well. Um, but the Data Our Elemental campaign, um, we believe a significant part of that will be associated with electronic case reporting. Obviously, there's a lot of public health infrastructure. This initiative, ECR, was in meaningful use in stage three, and then is in promoting interoperability, and the leverage for it, late, that late to the game, has been limited, the leverage of, of meaningful use. And so we do need that kind of, of, of shot in the arm relative to getting the implementation in EHRs and also upgrading infrastructure at the public health agencies, as was mentioned earlier. But it's very promising. Hi, thanks, John. I'm Matt Eisenberg, Stanford Healthcare. I have, I have two questions. I'll start with the easy one, and then maybe we can break on the hard one. Uh, the easy one is just, can you comment at all about is there any scope for uh, um, registry reporting for either state-based uh, condition registries or specialty society registries for the EC, you know, the ECR standard? Yeah. So I, I think there's a lot of shareable infrastructure for those purposes, and I have been doing my best to try to engage. That's basically the thrust of the common reporting framework. Is that these registries are doing largely the same things? You know that. The data are obviously different. Recognizing that, the rest of the infrastructure can be the same. We don't need to reinvent it, and we don't need to do it in 30 different ways and make those conf conflicting demands on EHR vendors. So we've been working on that. I'd say we've had mixed results in terms of, to this point of trying to get others on board. There, uh, Part of the thrust of that activity has been in HL7. HL7 has largely been a data organization to this point. With FIRE, they are now a technical and data organization, and, but we're still grappling, you know, so what I just talked about, a common reporting infrastructure is mostly technical. And uh, we, we've sought to um, integrate those concepts with DaVinci. Um, we had some success, uh, that's been a challenge. Partly because their their thrust is, you know, Da Vinci is a major HL7 standards initiative around payer connections, but they're doing quality measure reporting, and there's 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 commonality there. So we're optimistic. It still needs to move forward, and the more people we can have pushing in that direction, I think, the the more helpful it will be. Um, and the last question is: There's this little thing called meaningful use you may have heard of or remembered. We've been doing that for a while. We spent all this time getting actively engaged with all these co county-based systems. <laughs> We're still doing that now as part of promoting interoperability. There's this huge conversion, not even talking about adopting the standards and moving to FIRE, but all of the time we're spending with our interface teams supporting what we've been working on for 10 years and we're mandated by states to do. How do we get from here to there? And how do you sort of see what the, what's going to be the accelerator? So I know, I'm, I'll come around to the major thrust of your question, but I want to point out that you know, one of the things that really makes me overcome the hype of fire is the thought of automating interface development. So I mentioned that in the context of reporting, but it's really a much broader issue than that. And it's not just about querying and saying, you know, give me these data, because I think that's a bit overblown in terms of data authorities. Um, but it, it certainly, that's a viable strategy inside of healthcare organizations. It, it falls apart a little bit when you're talking about external organizations querying EHRs. Yep. But it's still, the concepts still apply even when you're pushing data out. And the, the ability to automate that develop, interface development so that it, you know, basically you don't have to do any coding to make a message or make a, a 
parcel of data to be transmitted is hugely powerful. And that's what we're trying to do in the reporting framework, but it's also applicable to other activities um, that are not about reporting, but about decreasing the proprietary software development that needs to occur to build interfaces between systems. So I think that's part of the solution. I don't think it, it answers the broader question that you've said about what really converts that, uh, you know, it, it turns that over. Um, I think that, you know, as much as I, I've, I hate to say it, that there may be a regulatory role and the issue is how, what is the right thing to regulate and how to do that in a way that it can be flexible enough but yet productive enough. And th that, you know, if, if the health IT agenda has gone up and down, the finesse with which regulation has been implemented has, is definitely going up and down. So we, you know, meaningful use received tremendous pushback. And, you know, but it also accomplished, when the right things were in place, it accomplished some pretty significant things. And I would point to public health in that regard. So the, you know, a lot of the pushback on meaningful use was around new business practices that were expected of EHR, or of, of providers of care. But in the public health domain, when you had a defined standard, and it was, you know, relatively mature, and you could then hang regulation on that, and say, you have to do it, it really worked well. The problem with case reporting is it was complicated enough. We didn't get into meaningful use one. We didn't get into meaningful use two. We got into three. At the end, the monies were ensconced and it, the leverage was you know, dissipated. But it, I, I, I have to say that the right kind of regulation can be tremendously enabling. The challenge is always sorting through what that right kind is. Hey, John, you mentioned the similarity between data exchange for quality measures and at reporting. Do you use in your uh, subscription model, or do you think you will use like CQL, the clinical query language, uh, quality language? Yeah, we, we've been uh, talking um, about that a lot. The, so in automating reporting in FHIR, the triggering can be automated. The validation of the content can be automated. The, um, the many other aspects of the who, uh, the when, where, and how of reporting can be automated. The one thing that FHIR doesn't do, is, which is critical to our process, is actually build an implementation guide, build the content, build the message. It doesn't do that. And it's shock it was shocking to me when I came upon this, and I've, you know, I had to go into technical depths beyond my league to, to get involved in that, it doesn't do that because the presumption is that you're querying to get your data. So fire servers actually will validate a query, an implementation guide for a query, but they will not produce a, a bundle of data in an implementation guide validated format. They don't do that. Fire servers don't do that. So one of the, the long story, but one of the things we're doing is we, we, we think that reporting should be part of the FHIR API. And you know, broaden that, you know, the patient interface needs to be part of the FHIR API. The provider interface needs to be part of the FHIR API. The population interface needs to be part of the FHIR API. And it's not there yet. The population interface is not there. This is one of the critical functions in that regard. We are starting with uh, having public health app development that would allow for automated reporting to the EICR standard, but we would like to advocate that th that building of a implementation guide data set would be something that a fire server would do as part of the API. Um, one step beyond having an app is doing it with C CQL. An operation. Yeah, and I, I mean, it was a long way around to that answer, but the CQL is not implementable. CQL obviously can do many other things. Clinical decision support, guideline implementation, um, as well as, but it can also do, it can actually, you can use a CQL engine to construct a report. Yes. And th th that's very promising. And if, if there was a CQL ev engine everywhere, we would use it. But our, our path right now is to say, Fire is very promising. We'll build an app that will do this so that we can provide it to those who need it. We don't want to be in that business for the long term. 
here's the specification for doing it in CQL too. And then you can choose which one you want and both are viable. My last question is a lot less technical. You mentioned earlier on that some of the states, if you give them too much data, they like won't take it. How does this electronic reporting address that and prevent the data elements they don't want from going to them? It's a really good question. And at, at the highest level, it does. So the data that are in the electronic initial case report were developed through a task force uh, of the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists to say these are the data that are needed in, um, in a case report. And that's what HIPAA asked for. HIPAA says that you can do reporting to public health if an appropriate public health authority identifies the data that are needed and those are what are presented. So the HIPAA basis for what I just described is solid. What public health is still grappling with and is going to grapple with for some time is, is that it's still much more data than they're used to. And they're very, public health agencies are very sensitive to. So even if they have, are enabled by state law and HIPAA to get the data, they have to develop some of the business practices to deal with the data. So think about comorbidities, you know? Yeah. You, you, you want comorbidities because they're important to public health, but you have to be able to handle them. And that's going to take some time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, John. That was great. So